I, I assume my screen share is working already. It is, yeah, it looks great. All right, good. Uh, so thanks for having me, uh, Ryan Martin. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I did for teaching Physics 104, 106 this year. And I'll focus a little bit on the aspects around uh, community building uh, among the students. So I want to talk a little bit about the problem that uh, we faced uh, going remote, uh, the solution that we came up with for teaching the course, and then a few outcomes and uh, concluding remarks. So context-wise, we asked students or even professors in other fields what physics is, and they find it hard. And it's true, it's hard because um, this is the calculus-based physics, and so they're asked to apply calculus in week one, but they're just enrolled in a calculus course at the same time. And they have to not only use calculus and understand it, but actually develop analytical abstract models of the physical world. And that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, on the other side, we also have to teach them about experimental physics. If you have a scientific question, how do you come up with hypotheses, uh, design an experiment and answer that question as best you can. And so it takes practice um, to become proficient at these uh, abstract skills um, that are required in physics. So normally in person on campus, <clears throat> the course is already uh, fairly complex. Uh, we teach it in a flipped classroom approach. So the, the, the students do readings at home and in the class time, the lectures are focused on clicker questions that they work on together, discuss as a group, and then uh, we discuss class-wide. They have a three hour um, tutorial or, or that's split up between lab and, and tutorial, which they work on uh, in groups once a week. Every week we give them uh, very difficult assignments um, that they work on during those tutorials. They have quizzes and exams. So they have quiz every two weeks and exams in December and April. Those exams have a group component. So they write the exam first individually, and then they get to rewrite the exam, the same exam as a group for additional marks. Um, so, so the incentive to them is obvious. And then for us, um, by thinking through the material individually and then discussing it again as a group, uh, it really uh, enforces the learning, uh, which is really what I care about. Uh, we have drop-in sessions uh, on campus on Wednesday evenings, normally where students can come in for three hours and interact with physics majors to get help on their assignments. So generally the course is designed to provide uh, practice thinking about physics and it's done in a, uh, a team setting so that they really learn to, to rely on their teammates to, to do well. So that's what we normally do. And so the context actually is the physics isn't so much hard as it is fun. And that's actually what a lot of the students say uh, after the course, because we put a lot of work uh, into making this more than just a learning physics, it's a whole experience. And so they, they go through this course with a community of students. It's almost a rite of passage for the, the physics students. Um, but by building this community, then they rely on each other when they're, when they're working. And that really allows them to do much better work and learn the material much better. So our problem was <clears throat> how um, do we transfer the, the experience that we like to give them on campus to this online setting? We wanna maintain the same high standards. This is the course that uh, physics majors need to take. Uh, we still want to build this community among the students um, because we know it will help them learn physics. And we still want them to have fun because we don't want them to think physics is hard. We want them to think physics is fun. So how do we do this from their bedroom? And so the solution I came up with, first of all, I ignored most advice on remote teaching, which was uh, a lot of advice that we received last summer. And, and so much it was contradictory that I just decided, OK, I'll just do what seems like common sense to me um, and then we'll see what happens. I don't think anybody really knows what they're doing. So I structured the course fundamentally uh, around mandatory synchronous sessions. And so we scheduled two 90 minute long mandatory sessions, camera on, uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays for all 24 weeks of the course. So week one and week 24, twice a week, nonstop. We gave the students three different time zone options. There's about 200 students in the class, just to get a sense. Um, three time zone options. And we also had uh, students from the Vader International Study Center, the BISC students that we picked up in the course. And so they had their own time zone. Uh, we managed this with nine TAs. So each TA had assigned to them a group of about 25 students. And then those group students were furthermore subdivided into groups of three to five. 
uh, we had a head TA to help coordinate this. And then the BISC instructor acted uh, like one of the other TAs with their own students. Um, so the TA maintained the same group of 25 students throughout the whole year. And so that really helps create this classroom, small classroom feeling uh, where the TA has a huge responsibility uh, in managing the, the, the 25 students or so that they have. The synchronous sessions, um, I highlight here some of the things that we would do during those sessions. So because we didn't have lectures, we, we still maintained the sort of flipped classroom approach. But the students completed readings instead of coming to lectures on Mondays and Wednesdays, the day before the synchronous session, they were given an online quiz to complete, which was similar to the clicker questions that they would receive in lecture. They were encouraged to do that quiz with their group mates um, and the solutions were provided to them. The synchronous session started with a review of the quiz from the day before. The students would also highlight areas of uh, concerns and the TAs would come in prepared knowing what issues to address to sort of replace the lectures and still have some discussion about the, the contents. Most of the time in the synchronous session though, the students would work in small groups of three to five, um, whether that be in a uh, experimental activity uh, or on their weekly assignments. So they would do that in a way that we could drop in uh, TAs and myself uh, multiple times during each tutorial. Um, so personally, well, I couldn't make the 4 p.m. because I had to pick up my kids, but I was able to attend, I would say, 80 to 90 percent of all the tutorials that took place um, at the other slots. Uh, so I gave the students a chance to interact uh, frequently with uh, TAs and profs, or a prof anyway. We also ran uh, proctored quizzes during these synchronous sessions. Every two weeks, the students would write an individual quiz, had multiple choice and long answers to submit on Crowdmark, and then rewrite it as a group and with accommodation. So it just logistically kind of a nightmare. Um, and at the end of the semester, we ran uh, presentations of the student projects that they had done. So in each semester they did projects and then at the uh, end of the semester they did some presentations. Another aspect of the solution was that we um, integrated video conferencing into Clicker, which is the web application uh, that we developed at Queens for administering quizzes and in-class uh, quizzes as well. So students would take these practice quizzes, um, the ones that they discuss uh, on Clicker. There was also a summative quiz that they would have to take on Clicker. Uh, and so it was a natural place to integrate the video conferencing. So the picture you see on the right here is the dashboard of what the profs and TAs see. So each little button is a different chat room. When it's green, it means there's people in it. You can hover over it and it'll give you a list of the people that's in it. So we had it set up this way so it'd be very easy for TAs and students to interact all with each other. So the chat rooms always exist. So students use them as a central point to meet outside of the course to do work. Uh, it was very easy, of course, to use during the synchronous sessions. Uh, it's all private and controlled at Queens 100%. Uh, and we even used it to proctor the final exam. So the screenshot at the bottom there uh, shows the nine TA rooms, each filled with students, camera on, um, writing their uh, December exam. And the third component of the solution is to maintain high expectations. I mean, that was also kind of the problem and the solution. The solution. <laughs> Um, so we gave the students the same uh, difficult weekly assignments that we give them in a normal year. And, and these are all kind of a rite of passage. These assignments are too difficult for students to complete on their own. So when they're on campus, it's easy for them to find somebody to work with. But we, gave, we put them in the same situation and forced them to find somebody to work with. Of course, we gave them a lot of support to do that. Um, we also gave them uh, difficult open-ended experimental uh, projects to do. Uh, in general, we gave them too much work to do in the 90 minutes unless they came prepared um, and, uh, you know, uh, capable of dividing up the work and working as a team. So we really forced them to have to use the community and then we provided the support to build that community. And so just a few outcomes. Um, I haven't actually received the QSET results, so <laughs> uh, I've only received positive unsolicited emails uh, so far. I wanted to highlight a few of the ones that um, speak to some of the successes that we had. Um, so in particular here, uh, students speaking of making friends, meeting profs, uh, um, building a community um, is really what we're trying to do. The second comment, uh, the community that all the upper years talk about, 
That's because we were able to get students to go to these drop-in sessions, have them interact with physics majors, and learn more about what it's like to be in physics. And so creating those, uh, that sense of community that, that we like to have in physics. Uh, also, some of the, the comments speak to the fact that you know, challenging them is important. Um, and that, that did help making it enjoyable. Um, you know, we had some advice going into this that you should take it easy on the students, et cetera, and things like that. And um, I think there's ways to do it right and, and keep the standards high. I wanted to also give some examples of the experimental projects that they did. Uh, I was really impressed, to be honest. The groups on the left there, the three pictures on the left, these are groups, uh, one group, sorry, that was um, tasked with uh, investigating standing waves. And so they each built uh, wind instruments uh, with pipes of various lengths, et cetera. Um, and they played a tune for us during their final presentation. So that was, that was super fun. Um, Rosa, you see here, uh, built a, a kind of a flute thing with these copper tubes. Uh, AJ built this uh, gigantic uh, contraption here. It's two full octaves with these tubes that he could play with uh, kitchen spatulas. It was just really cool to see what the students were doing from home. Um, the picture in the, the middle, the, the sort of colorful one, uh, the students uh, set up a fancy apparatus. This is all homemade, right? To measure the viscosity of maple syrup by timing how long it takes little ball bearings to fall through the maple syrup. Um, and then we'll highlight one more, the cloud chamber. Um, so this is a student that uh, built a particle uh, detector. So a cloud chamber is a, is a thing that can detect uh, subatomic particles. It's very difficult to build in practice. Um, and this student, she was able to do it in Toronto in a lockdown, uh, which is impressive because she had to um, uh, obtain some dry ice and she was e even able to, to, to test multiple designs. Um, so I think this is sort of some, some really cool examples of the things that we were able to do in, in the course. So just a few uh, uh, concluding remarks. Uh, generally, I think it sucks, both from a teaching and a learning uh, perspective, this remote thing. Um, I think creating a sense of community is even more critical in this um, you know, remote setting where the students are by themselves and feel disconnected. I think it is possible to foster the student collaboration, to make them do projects that are greater than some of the parts. Um, it did suck though, I would say in general. Um, it took a huge number of resources to do you know, whatever successes we did have, those were not easy successes to have. We had uh, specifically a large number of TAs, basically one TA for 25 students at 10 hours a week. And not just a regular TA, they're, they're really super TAs, I would say. Um, I've heard good things from students. So I have had lots of unsolicited uh, positive email, but obviously I haven't heard back from the students that were not engaged. I'm sure plenty of them were, and it was a nightmare for them. I imagine, I don't know. <laughs> um, so in general, you know, I think we did okay. And we have some measures of successes and I, I think I put in the honest best effort that I could. I don't think the learning was the same as it has in past years. And so um, I have mitigated feelings about how this played out. So I'll leave it on that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>